Today is our third session of our Dharma sharing series on Breaking Myths by Dr. Punya Wong. If you have missed the first session, Breaking Myths, Religion, Yanas and Lineages, and our second session, which was last week, on Breaking Myths, Transferring Merits, you are still able to view them, the recorded version on our SJBA Facebook page. So tonight, our Dharma sharing is entitled Breaking Myths number three, Karma and Fate. So let me now introduce our prominent speaker for tonight, Dr. Punya Wong. He is currently an Associate Professor in Internal Medicine at Monash University, Malaysia, based in Johor Bahru. He's an established Dharma speaker who has been regularly speaking and sharing Dharma in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok for the last two decades. He had also been invited to speak at the third, seven, and eight global conference on Buddhism. And due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, in this era of new norm, Dr. Wong has now shifted his focus to sharing Dharma online via Zoom, Facebook, and even WhatsApp. And Dr. Wong has just recently published a Dharma ebook comprising a collection of sharings on the theme of Breaking Myths, which was just launched last week on September 16, which happens to be the theme of our sharing sessions on Friday nights. And a sneak peek on next Friday's talk, in fact, Dr. Punya will be sharing the number four of this series on Breaking Myths. Um, thereafter, he will then only be back later on when the audience are rejuvenated and hungry for more Dharma. So stay tuned, everyone. So I shall now hand over to Dr. Punya Wong for his Dharma sharing tonight. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, Namo Buddhaya, and thank you for all those who had sent comments for me to see. It's very, very encouraging because nowadays when we share the Dhamma, we are literally just looking into a computer monitor, having no idea what's happening to our audience. So thank you for at least saying, uh, Sadhu or hello or anything to let me know that I'm actually speaking to visible beings. Now, tonight is the third in this series that Subang Jaya Buddhist Association had invited me. And tonight we are talking about myths with regard to karma and fate. Now, the Buddhist teachings on karma is actually quite different from what was believed in during his time. When the Buddha was around 2,600 years ago, there were already established beliefs on what karma is or was. But the Buddha's view on it was actually quite radically different from what was widely believed in at that time. And even today, many people then, as well as today, believe that karma is fate or predestination, that everything that happens to us happened because of past karma. And that karma is fixed, is immutable, and hence we are fated to be what we are and will be. So this three that I've noted here are actually even quite often believed in by people today. And the Buddha disagreed. And the principal thing that the Buddha disagreed with is that the car is driven by us, not by some other person. We are the drivers of that car. We can change the direction of the car. We can change where we want to head to. And that is the major difference between what the Buddha taught 
and what was the established belief 2,600 years ago and even now. Now, the Buddha knew and taught that karma is only one of many things that will affect us. It is fluid. It is ceaselessly changing all the time, like the water flowing in the river. And each, every one of us, each individual, has that ability to alter his personal karma by his or her present acts. In simple words, it's in our hands. Our present circumstances are the result of countless factors in the distant and immediate past. And karma is so complex because there are so many factors which would have given rise to causes and conditions that no human mind can unravel its complexities. Well, let me illustrate. Why am I sitting on my chair now talking to my computer, sharing with you all? It's a long, long story with many, many causes. About 20, 30 years ago, I met the late Bhante Mahachara. At that time, he was not yet a Sangha member, and we were friends. And because of him, I started involving myself in many Dhamma sharing activities in Johor Bahru. And then later on, when Bhante Mahachara became a monk, you had a close affinity with Subang Jaya Buddhist Association. And he actually recommended that I should go up and share. But it never came to pass until COVID-19 literally gave the digital temple the number one priority. And so because of that, Subang Jaya contacted me and here I am today. So you can see that the reason why I am sitting here talking and you are sitting on your side of the computer listening is a result of many, many factors, many causes and conditions. If not of COVID-19, for example, this might not be taking place. But because of so many factors, we are now sitting and looking at each other. And so there is no one single cause that makes everything to be the way it is. The causes or the seeds that we plant are countless. Now, the Buddha very clearly rejected three views. And I think this we have to be very clear about. It is in the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Three, this course 61. And the Buddha clearly rejected that all our happiness, all our suffering, all our future happiness and suffering arises from the past karma. And because of that past karma, you and I have no chance, nothing to be able to change that event that is going to unravel. That is past action determinism, or what very commonly we call as fate. But the Buddha say, no, this is not true. You and I can change it. It does not mean that you are fated to marry this girl or that man. You can say no. So that past action determinism of fate was clearly rejected by the Buddha. Again, he says, it's in your hands. You can choose at every moment to make a decision which will alter the near and distant future. The second thing that the Buddha discarded is what some people believe that all my happiness, all my suffering is the dictate of some being somewhere that is big that controls my life what is called theistic determinism. That means some God or something, some external force controls it. And the Buddha say no. And quite often, this we used to illustrate by saying, oh, you are born into this caste. You can't change because you are born into this caste. You have been created to be in this caste and you can't marry up, you can only marry down, you can't work up, etc. Again, the Buddha rejected that. He said, no, that's not true. It's in your hands. Cars are man-made. And finally, the belief that everything is random. No cause. 
That, the Buddha said, is also not true because everything is cause, conditions, and effect. Cause are the seeds that we plant immediate future, past or distant past. Conditions are, well, the conditions as it exists now. And the effects or the fruits is what will come out as a result of the seeds and the conditions. So everything has a causal relationship which is very, very complex. It is not completely or random or by chance or completely indeterminate. So past action determinism, that means it is fate. Something you did in the past, that's it. You cannot do anything. So what the Buddha was very clear is that not all karma, not all the seeds that you plant leads to an effect. Now, the cause or the seed that we plant is called karma. And karma results from a thought in our mind, an intentional thought. The result or the effect will only come in when the conditions are appropriate for it. And that is called vipaka. But even understanding what is karma, what is vipaka, we must also understand that not all seeds will come to fruition. If the conditions are not there, that seed that is planted will not come to fruition. So when the cause are there and the corresponding appropriate conditions are there, then yes, there will be the effect. Let's put it this way. Let's say somebody is gifted. All right? He might be very gifted in playing a piano, for example. But he is born into an environment or a culture whereby piano playing is not a common thing, or it may be even frowned upon. The parents expect him to earn a living, helping out with the family business, etc. And so, even though he may have a talent there, because the conditions are not appropriate, the fruits are not going to arise. Or similarly, in Malaysia, we force all our children to study piano, la, piano lesson, taekwondo lesson, etc., etc. But many of them are simply not that talented nor interested. And so even though we plant the seeds, there is no effect. So the critical point is that the effect or the fruit, if and when it happens, is in accordance with, yes, the seed that was planted, but the conditions for its arising must be there. And you and I can vary that condition. It is not fate. It is not determinism by a god or a being or something. Because the Buddha also made it clear that if you believe this is so, that means some creator somewhere made you a murderer, then you will have no choice but to be a murderer. In which case, the Buddha said, all spiritual training will be useless. And that is manifestly not true. You can choose what you want to be. So this, the Buddha said, is wrong. What is karma? Now, the Buddha said, intention or chetana, he said, is karma. Because of our intention, you will create karma by body, speech, and mind. And chetana refers to volitional or intentional thoughts that become translated. It has to be something that I want to do. So this is important because to understand this requires that we will have to understand some pretty profound teachings of the Buddha. A lot of things that we glance through, think we understand, but are actually only scraping the surface. But I want to take you on this journey to help you remember that first, it must begin with an intentional or volitional thought. I want to go out and eat cha kui tiao. That's an intentional thought in the mind. That thought can be translated into speech. So I tell my wife, I want to go eat cha kui tiao. And finally, that thought can be translated into action. 
we actually go out to eat char kway teow. My arms and my legs cannot go out to eat char kway teow. They need the mind to tell them to do certain things. So karma begins in the mind. So both karma and vipaka are essentially mental. So if I think I want to help Subang Jaya Buddhist Association, that will create an imprint in my mind. Yes, yes, yes. I'm obliged to help because I promised them I will help. But it stops there. Now, Brother Tuan texts me. Nowadays, we don't talk, we text. And so I say through the text, yes, I want to help Subang Jaya Buddhist Association. So now it is not only just a thought. It has been translated into a communication. And that leaves a stronger imprint in my consciousness. And so finally now, I'm actually giving the talk. This is the third week we are doing so. So that will leave an even bigger imprint in my consciousness, just as it is leaving an imprint in all your consciousness. So if Sister Liming has been listening to all my three talks, at the end of this third talk today, Sister Liming is going to be a different person from one hour ago, from one week ago, from two weeks ago. Imagine, this is just me talking. Had she paid attention, what I have said would have made her a different person. Whether she likes it or not, that imprint is in her mind. And it is going to affect her future. So every one of our volitional action will leave imprints in our conscious, our stream of consciousness. And it will give rise to consequences. Now, there are many other factors which will affect our lives, and these are not karma. For example, natural disasters, floods that happen every year in the East Coast, tsunamis that happen now and then, a COVID-19 pandemic which occurs maybe once every few decades, and of course, earthquakes. This is nature. This is not our karma. I still remember the last great tsunami, 200,000 people died in Sumatra alone. The late Chief Venerable was asked, is this karma? And the late Chief Venerable replied, no, it is because the earth plates moved. And I think that that is probably the best answer. So I like this cartoon strip. Life is very hard. I have a terrible feeling, Charlie Brown said, that as I grow older, it's not going to get any easier. Well, Charlie Brown has got insight here. So he asks the psychiatrist, is there anything I can do to protect myself? And she gave a very good answer. Try wearing a helmet. Five cents, please. Now, this is very Zen. It is very immediate. It is very realistic. It is not metaphysical. It is not you pray. It is not you do something. It's simple. Wear a helmet. It's like... You know, Ajahn Brahm said, was interviewed. You remember at the height of the Middle East war with Kuwait, people were imprisoned somewhere in the south of Cuba, and they did terrible things like flushing the Koran down the drain or something like that. And then Ajahn Brahm was asked in an interview, you are a Buddhist, you are a respected leader. What will you do, Ajahn, if somebody takes the Dhammapada and flush it down the toilet. Now, you and I know how thick the Dhammapada with his commentary is. Ajahn Brahm's immediate reply was, well, I will call the plumber. And I think that that's very Zen, very practical, very realistic, not something metaphysical. And that is what the Buddha Dharma teaches us. Now, this is not karma. This is anicca. This is impermanence. So you cannot blame this on karma. This is a nature. This is a universal truth, a fact of life, whether you like it or you do not like it. Now, karma kitchen. I put this slide up because someone asked me, is there an expiry date for karma? If karma doesn't come to fruition, let's say this month, this year, next year, this decade, this life, is there an expiry date, he said. 
Well, there is no expiry date for karma. You know, I'm sure everyone of us sitting now looking at a computer, we can look back at our younger days. Some of you are in your 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe some are in your 70s. Look back at your younger days. Look back at the time when you were a teenager, when you were a young man. Look at your mind then. And look at your mind now. Well, our bodies have aged tremendously. But if you look at our mind, I sometimes think that my mind is still the mind of a 20-year-old, just as naughty, just as inquisitive, except that the body is not. Now, our stream of consciousness goes on. We are, in fact, to improve, evolve our spiritual state with every life. Our stream of consciousness flows like a river. It doesn't grow old. The body, yes, will grow old. So there's no expiry date for anything that is planted in your stream of consciousness. So what is karma? In summary, the Buddha said, we must remember this very well, it is a volitional action. It is an intentional action. It is something you will to do. And yes, that intentional action will be translated a thought, a speech, an action. And that will give rise to consequences. If it is based on good things, wholesome things, the consequences are wholesome. If it is unwholesome in its origin, then the consequences are unwholesome. But note that an involuntary, in unintentional action does not constitute karma. Here I wish to thank the late Bhante Punaji because he has really opened our minds to a very important aspect of the Buddhist teaching. You know, we use these three words that you see at the side. Mano, citta, vinyana, almost interchangeably. They should not. The Buddha had used these three words. And the Buddha was very, very specific. And Bhante Punaji, as I said, was the man that I would credit for having brought this up to us. And there's another venerable in Singapore who wrote the commentary to a Dhammapada who also had similar teachings. But here, the important word I want you to know is the word mano. Mano has the same root word as what we in Malay call manusia, or even in Pali, manusia. Manusia, human beings, we have that intellectual capability, that cognitive ability, that ability to think, analyze, and come to a decision as to what to do. That's why we are manusia. We have that ability. In contrast, the lower animals do not have such highly refined faculties. So manu refers to that cognitive function, that intellectual ability, that ability to compose beautiful poems like Shakespeare, that ability to draw beautiful paintings, that ability to compose music like Mozart. That's manu. And the other word the Buddha uses, citta. In the Dhammapada, there's a whole chapter devoted to citta. And again, very often we just translate citta as mind, which is not right. And we in Malaysia are very blessed because we understand Malay that borrowed heavily from Pali and Sanskrit. If I say, Sister Liming is very happy, then I say she is sukkachitta. Both are Pali words. Sukha is a word that you are familiar with, happiness. And citta, sukha citta, her mind is so happy with this emotion of bliss and joy. Or if I say, Sister Li Ming is dukkha citta, again, both words are Pali words, dukkha, you understand? Stress, emo, unhappiness, and citta, her emotional state. So citta is not just mind. Chitta refers to our emotional state. 
And of course, the other word the Buddha used is vinyana, which means our ability to be able to perceive, to be conscious of something. Now, I beg that you know these three words, because if you know these three words, let us come to two very, very common verses that we quote all the time. And this is Dhammapada verse 1 and 2. Dhammapada verse 1 and 2, very often we say, mind is foremost, mind is chief, mind precedes all things. With wholesome mind, if you speak, if you act, sorry, with an unwholesome mind, if you speak and you act, then Dukkha will follow you like the cart that follows the ox. That is our English translation. But if you look at the Pali, the Buddha is so specific. The Buddha used the word Manu. 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 It is not just the mind. It is Sister Liming's cognitive function, her intentional thought, what she wants. That is what will precede all her actions. And that is what creates her karma. Similarly, the second verse, which we are familiar with, again, often translated, mind is foremost, mind is chief. With a wholesome mind, if you speak and act, then happiness, sukha, follows you like a shadow that never leaves. We are again familiar with that line. But again, the word that is used is not just mind. It is manu, which refers to your intellect, your cognitive function, which leads to an action. And that is what creates karma. So the late Venerable Punaji, his translation uses cognition instead of mind. As I said, very grateful that he actually pointed this out to us. So karma is mind made. It is made by that intentional thought. This is the traditional translation, which is a little bit out of what I So. If you look that with an intentional thought of doing something wholesome, you will find that the consequence or the result could be big, could be small, and we cannot predict it. An action that is not wholesome, similarly, we cannot predict it. So. It is beyond our ability. We can only know the principle. And this happens without needing a god or gods to determine. If I intentionally take a cup and I drop it onto my cement floor, it will shatter. Now, let us take what would be considered a minor unwholesome act. Somebody's birthday, Everybody say, oh, come on, Sister Li Ming, what's a little bit of beer? How would it help? Just a cup won't hurt. And so because of peer pressure, she said, okay, la, okay. La. So one cup. And that led to two cups. And she said, no, 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 I can't take anymore. I have to stop. Which is very good of her. So we might say, okay, small little thing. She's going to go home and sleep. Doesn't have much bad thing. So... She drives, and because she's the one that has the least alcohol intake, her gang sits into her car. But just because she has got her mind now less mindful than usual, an accident happens. It's unpredictable. She may knock someone, a motorcyclist, she may hurt something, whatever, you can imagine it. So from a little seed that is unwholesome that was planted, it could lead to consequences much bigger than what we can anticipate. So similarly, what is wholesome that we plan, we also cannot predict. It may be something very small, or it may be something good. A few years ago, I wrote a book, 
Only yesterday, Sister Siu Yin, who is on the audience right now, part of one of the 181 person, told me, oh, a friend told me she wrote, she read, he or she read your book and started learning the Dhamma. So I said, okay, now I can die in peace because I've at least helped one person. So that person might go on to become an Arahan for all I know, or maybe a future Buddha, I don't know. But it started with a few years ago, a talk. Maybe I should collate all that I've been sharing all these years into a book. Just that thought. So we do not know, we can't predict what this act will lead to. And we don't have to. Our sada, our confidence, our faith, for lack of a better word, is that in doing a wholesome act, it will give rise to a wholesome effect. It is not a cosmic legal system of rights or wrongs. Strictly speaking, in the Buddha Dharma, there is no right, no wrong. Only cause, condition, and effect. There's no divine judge, no judgment day, no. You drop a glass, it will crack, that's it. It is simply cause and effect under the right conditions. This is one of the lines that I love very much. This that you see is written by one of my students, in fact, the president of the Buddhist society at my uni right now, she wrote this. But it's a very common teaching which says, Pusa pa ying, chung sen pa kuo. If you are a wise person, you will be very, very afraid of the seeds or the cause that you plant. The ordinary person is very afraid of the fruits. For example, now, let's say, he is having fruits which are unpleasant. So he's very afraid, he's moaning, he's groaning, he's complaining, oh, such terrible things, such horrible effect. But he is not aware that at this moment he's planting, planting, planting many seeds. Think of it this way, you have a big garden. Every day we are planting. Are you planting fruits which are beautiful, edible? Or are you planting weeds? Most of us will plant a mixture. But let us hope that our fruits are far more in quantity than our weeds. Unless you are a fully awakened being, you will still be planting some weeds. But the fact is, if you are wise, you will be very afraid of the seeds that you are planting. If you are foolish, you will just be moaning, groaning, and complaining about the fruits that you are experiencing right now, which actually arises from past seeds. Now, what about collective karma? Something people always ask me. Now, there is no mention at all in the Buddhist teachings about collective karma. And if you understand the Buddhist teachings that our karma is individual, then you will understand why the idea of collective karma is not consistent. And Ajahn Brahmali had actually replied to someone, written it in his reply, that there is no evidence for collective karma in the suttas. And the expression in the suttas is that you are the heir of your own karma, a line that again, almost everyone in here would be familiar with. If there is a collective element to this, then the implication is that you will be the heir to other people's karma as well. And that is not right. So if you do see, for example, tsunami or wars or some mass accidents, something like that, it is more likely that it is the individual karma of a group of people that because of their attachment, their karmic affinity ripens together rather than collective karma. It is individual karma ripening together. So it is very important that we must understand the teachings of karma. It is part of samaditi or right views that you must understand what is karma. So where is karma stored? Well, it's not stored in a bank account somewhere. It's like asking, 
if you plant a durian seed, where is that durian tree stored? That durian tree is in the potential of that durian seed. That is all. It is not stored somewhere. You don't have a durian tree in a celestial safe somewhere that has to be brought down. No, it's the same like that. And this was the reply the Venerable Nagasena gave when questioned by King Milanda. So don't ask, why always me? Why always me? The question is, why not you? Why are you so special? Why not you? Now, we always will moan and groan when something that is unpleasant has happened to us. And then we say, why me? Why me? Reflect. Why not you? Why are you so special that it can happen to everybody except you? So it's, why not you? You are just like any other person, subject to illness, subject to COVID-19, when the cause and the conditions are there. All right. Now, when something good happens, why don't you say, why always me? Why do we just take it for granted? When something good happens, why don't you say, why me? You know, I, yo, I shouldn't have this thing. We don't. We just accept it. Now, some of you might be familiar of the concept of the niyamas. It talks about nature, genes, psychology, climate, etc., etc. But these are actually later writings. And as I mentioned, even within the Theravada tradition, there are a lot of things which are written much later after the death of the Buddha. And the five niyamas, Uttu niyama, Bija niyama, for example, these are not found in the suttas. What is found in the sutta is that there was a wanderer called Moliya Sivaka. And he asked the Buddha whether everything that happens to us happens because of past karma. And this was apparently a point that he and his fellow philosophers of the day were discussing. Whether everything that happens, happens because of past karma. And the Buddha replied, Whatever a person experiences, pleasant, unpleasant, or neither, all this is caused by what was done in the past. If you say this, the Buddha said, you will exceed what is known by oneself. You exceed what is considered true in the world. Therefore, I say, those ascetics and Brahmins are wrong. I do not think you can find a stronger statement than this. This is a very strong statement by the Buddha with regards to this, a common question that people ask. And the Buddha goes on to tell Sivaka that there might be experiences due to bow, phlegm, wind, natural things, imbalance of the humors as they understand it in their time and how they describe it then, a change in the season, and it could be the result of some karma. But this is so complex and the point the Buddha is making here is that you cannot attribute all of your things from your illness to your COVID to past karma. That would be too simplistic. And this is in the Samyutta Nikaya. So it is very important to know that karma holds the key to our change in life. I said just now, it is in your hands. You are the driver. Now in the... Lonapala Sutta, the Sot Crystal Sutta, is a very short sutta in Anguttara Nikaya Book of Trees, Discourse number 99. I would strongly encourage all of us here to take a look at it. And in the Sot Crystal Sutta, the Buddha described using the analogy of salt. And he said, let us say you have this amount of salt. If you put this amount of salt in a cup of water and you drink it, it will be very, very salty. If you take the same amount of salt and put it in, for example, a river, the Ganges River was a common example used then, and then you take back the water and you drink, will it be salty? The answer is no. But he said the amount of salt is the same, just that the conditions are different. Our present acts can change our future. It can even mitigate your past coming effects. But that salt has not disappeared. It is still there. 
it is just that the conditions have changed. I repeat, karma, good or bad, does not disappear. It is in our stream of consciousness. It is an imprint in psychological terms onto our psychic. That does not change, but the conditions change. We had given a different condition which would have altered the effects of that seed. Let me give another example. You know, people lose their loved ones. They become very sad. Of course, understandably so. Do we realize that that grief actually does not go down? It does not disappear? Even years later, they are still affected by an event which will bring it to mind. What has changed is that in the acute bereavement, the conditions, the water was very little. The salt was in a cup. What has happened, maybe a year, two years, three years down the road, as kayanamitas, we help the person, is that we had diluted it in a much bigger quantum of water. But that salt is still the same. The quantity is still the same. But its effects are not the same because the conditions have changed. So to the question, does karma have an expiry date? The answer is no. It does not have an expiry date. Will karma at the end of one year disappear or have, like my Maggie me, an expiry date and then my wife say cannot eat, throw away? No, that is not true. It's going to be that. It's just what are the conditions that we are supplying, whether that salt will be salty in its taste or tasteless is up to us. So karma, good or bad, does not disappear. Thank goodness, because we don't want our good karma to disappear. But it is cause, conditions, and effect. Without the appropriate conditions, karma does not come to fruition. So even if the root causes are there, their results will not arise if the conditions for there to come to fruition is not there. A seed, for example, a durian seed, a Mao Sang Wang seed has the potential to become a beautiful tree with lots of Mao Sang Wang. But for that to happen, that seed must be planted in the right soil somewhere in the mountains of Rao and Bentong. It must have the right amount of water, fertilizer, sunlight, and government. If any of those things change, your Mao Sang Wang is going to change. So, the quantum of salt is the analogy for our karma, both good and bad. So if you do good things, but then you do a lot of horrible things as well, then your good karma, the good deeds may not have a chance to come to fruition. And similarly, if you had done something which are not so wholesome, and now we do lots of good things, the conditions for the unwholesome thing to come to fruition is not there. So what we do now will be to create the conditions for our past karma, either good or bad, the seeds that were planted, to manifest gloriously or be mitigated. We are all born holding variable amounts of salt and water. Some of us have lots of salt, some of us have lots of water, vice versa. This is the fruits of our past, the quo. What is more important now is to realize that your tomorrow, your next week, your next year will be determined by what we are planting today. So whatever fruits we have today, we will handle it with metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. Loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. But be very cautious about the sleets that you are planting. Make sure that wholesome water dilutes and wholesome salt. Now I want to bring you back to verse 1 and verse 2 of the Dhammapada. As I told you, the Buddha's teachings are very, very profound. If you compare it with any other teaching, the Buddha's teachings are far more profound. Let us take a look at verse 2 first. From our cognitive function, we decide to do something good, wholesome. Well, 
Mahavihara at Brickfields now has a roof which is collapsing and they're asking for donations. So we say, oh, yes, yes, we must support. The economy is bad. It's going to be difficult for them to raise the money. So those of us who can, let us support. That's a good, wholesome thought. A good thought. You create that thought. You act on it by actually going to the bank and transferring the money. And Mahavihara receives it. So they rebuild the Vihara. It's the, actually the lodging for the monks. So you're actually providing the lodging for the monks, which is very good. Something praised. So that's a good seed that we had planted. That good seed that you had planted remains in your stream of consciousness. So you speak, act with a pure mind. Happiness will follow you. The Buddha said, like a shadow that never departs. Now let me ask you, brothers and sisters, all 187 of you in the audience right now, add in your wife and your girlfriend and your boyfriend, maybe 200. Do any one of us here appreciate our shadow? Does Sister Liming say thank you for my shadow? None. The shadow is so light. We don't even bother about it. But the Buddha used that analogy. It's like a shadow that follows you, that you're not even aware of. So, so many good things has happened to Sister Liming. Is she aware of it? So many good things have happened to all the 200 of us. Are we aware of it? Are we grateful for it? Most of the time, no. I always say we are never grateful for the fact that we do not have a toothache now until we have a toothache. None of us, I'm sure, sitting now have a toothache. Are we grateful for that? No. That's like a shadow. Now, what will happen when you walk into a dark room? Do you still have a shadow? That shadow disappears. So if the conditions are bad, that shadow, that good, does not come to fruition anymore. But it's okay. As long as you can go back into a bright light, that shadow will return. It doesn't disappear. Your good karma does not disappear. It's a potential. See the profundity of this lesson? Now, similarly, you go to verse 1 of the Dhammapada. Cognition precedes all experiences, the late Venerable Punaji said. It predominates and even creates them. With unwholesome thought, if one speaks or acts, pain will follow as the perish follows this poor animal that drags it. Now, if I would ask every one of us here to drag something, you know, just a supermarket trolley with a lot of stuff, we will be moaning and groaning and dragging it all along. Because that will be very, 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 very hurting, emotional. We all love to complain. So just like that animal dragging that cart, we feel it every second, every moment. So you have a toothache. Wow, you're going to appreciate every second of that toothache. You curse the dentist if he says, see you in three days. You know, your answer is, I want you to treat me now. So when something bad happens, we say, it's my bad karma. We are so aware of it. Chinese have a lot of words which are actually in our common psychic. The older generation of my family will say something like, Ayo, chin sai lo. What does that mean? We listen to it all the time, isn't it? What does it mean? Literally translated to those who don't speak Cantonese, is chin sai is, Ayo, my past life. That means they say, what have I done in my past life that has given rise to this? Or some might say, Ayo, chin sai im sao lo. That means my past life I did not cultivate. And it has given rise to this horrible condition now. See, it's so much in our subconsciousness, it's even in our language. Now, please remember that we can make your carriage lighter by giving you a well, beautifully paved road. We can make your carriage lighter by putting less stuff on it. We can make your supermarket trolley better by giving it functional wheels. So even bad seeds planted in the past can be made lighter. 
And of course, nowadays we can automate it and make it painless. So we can change the conditions. So again, I bring you to this point. The wise do not fear the fruits of yesterday, but are very careful with the seeds that you plant today. Appreciate your shadows. So what does it mean when we say practice? You incorporate the teachings of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Buddha Dharma into our lives. It's values, culture, behavior, likelihood, interest. The first teaching of the Buddha after he became enlightened. If I had to ask Sister Li Ming, what's the first teaching of the Buddha after he became enlightened? Hmm, and Li Ming would think, think, think. Hmm, Dhamma Chaka Pawa Tana Sutta la. This fellow trying to catch me la. Okay. No, Li Ming, no, no, no. The first teaching of the Buddha after he became enlightened is not the Dhamma Chaka Pawa Tana Sutta. For that, another one more Chasu Pao you owe me. The first teaching of the Buddha after he became enlightened is not by words. What did the Buddha do immediately after he became enlightened? He paid his gratitude and respect to the Bodhi tree for shielding him. The first lesson the Buddha taught is the lesson of gratitude. And then, of course, there are the values. The five precepts are basic secular human values. All right? But then upholding honesty, morality, you know, our two arms, abandon our unwholesome ways, be mindful, restrained in our senses, middle path, cultivating samadhi or stillness of the mind, and of course, hopefully, walking the path to awakening. Now, beings are owners of their action, heirs of their action. We are originating from our action, our intentional action. We are bound to our action, have our actions as our refuge. And it is this action which distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. We are all familiar with this line. As I shared last week, if someone stops you at the bus stop and says, Brother, who is your creator? Tell them straight in the face, Kama is my creator. And the Buddha, by this one line, has clearly taught us that karma is individual. I laugh all the time and joke all the time by saying that if we can share karma, then at my death, I want to share all my bad karma with all of you. And then, of course, it's not true. Your karma is individual. You cannot wash away Sister Li Ming's karma by my good deeds. Why see versa? So this, of course, now we clean our hands as we enter every shop, every mall, every office, so much so that I, I don't know whether I'm drinking alcohol through my hands or not, but every day we are rubbing it a few times. So while karma is individual, what you do will affect others. And this was actually a question again that was raised to me. The question said, will the bad karma of a father or elder Will it pass down to the next generation? That means your grandfather was a drug addict or some terrible person. Now the grandchildren suffer the consequences of his bad action because his karma has come down to you. Well, that's not true. Karma is individual. If your grandfather was somebody bad, that karma is his karma. But what he did will affect you because he has created conditions which will affect you. For example, let's say you have someone who is a gambler and he squandered away all the money that should be used for teaching, education. So now the children have got no education. But vice versa, if you got good karma, good people who did a lot of good deeds, that vipaka can affect people. Some of you might be beneficiaries of scholarships. Some of you would have heard of Tan Ka Ki who started a whole university in China, and now even a branch in Malaysia. Not him, of course, but his foundation. Some of you might have benefited from Lee Foundation, who was the son-in-law of Tankaki. So their decision 
to do something good is good karma, which is just. But they have effects on other people, including you and me. All right? Now, this is again another point that not many people are aware of. People talk about good karma, bad karma. The Buddha went further. The Buddha talked about good karma. He called that white karma. Bad karma. He called that black karma. And then the Buddha talked about karma, which is both black and white, which is gray, of course. And then he talked about karma, which leads to the end of karma. I hope you realize 196 of us here, that awakening or enlightenment leads to the end of the effects of karma. I hope I'm, you're not shocked by this. Karma is what you and I now do based on our intentional action. It will have effects. For example, when we die, we are the heir of that karma. We are created by that karma. But for someone who is fully awakened, it is the end of the effects of karma. No more. And what is the path of practice leading to the end of karma? The Noble Eightfold Path. What you and I are doing by following the Noble Eightfold Path is not just creating white karma, avoiding Blank karma, but we are also doing our best to lead to the end of the effects of karma when we die. So I already told you, the Buddha classified it like that. Black karma with black result. White karma with white result. And karma that is both black and white with black and white result. And you may wonder, what is this black and white with black and white result? Most of the time. What we do is karma that is black and white with black and white result. Let me explain. This is again a question that was raised to me. Today I'm answering many questions before question and answer time because this was actually raised to me. Someone raised to me. What's the difference between fu bao, fu bo, and gong de? Now, a lot of times, my apologies to the Arahan in this group. But a lot of times when we do good deeds, wholesome deeds, we still have spiritual greed within us. We do it because we say, ah, maybe I do it, ah, then, ta, ta, ta. Maybe I do this, then I have happy life. Maybe I do this, something good happens. So this is called karma that is black and white. It is good. We are doing a good deed. But within that good deed, there is still some greed. It is rare that someone is so wise, so non-self, that what he does is absolutely altruistic, without thinking of what is there to benefit me, or what in Hong Kong they will say, your me jok so sin. I understand I'm talking to a crowd that basically speaks Cantonese because you are based in Kiel. All right, I have students from Hong Kong. People in Hong Kong are very pragmatic people. Their conditions have, are such that they have become very, very pragmatic people. What is in there for me? Your may joke so. Now, the Buddha said that it's also karma that is neither black nor white, with neither black nor white result, but it leads to the ending of karma. And this, of course, is the Noble Eightfold Path. And of course, whether it is white karma, black karma, or both black and white karma, it is manifested through bodily, verbal, and mental fabrication. So coming back to this, a lot of people will do good deeds, but it is not purely altruistic. They do it with thoughts of return. That means, I don't know 10 ringgit, but I expect somewhere along the way I make back 100 ringgit, you know? That's greed. So while there is, of course, a good start by saying, I wish to dana. 
but there is also some black. So it's gray. Lah. So that, of course, will also have good consequences, not to say that it does not have. All right? Now, that will be what, when a good consequence result, called football, some form of material prosperity. Bung te or bung ta is when you do it purely because it is the good thing to do, not because I want a return. So this is what I was trying to explain. Okay. Remember that karma that is neither black nor white leading to the end of karma is the Eightfold Path. Okay. And this intention is to lead to the end of karma. So the Eightfold Path, the Buddha clearly said, is the karma that is neither black nor white with neither black nor white result leading to the end of karma. So where do fully awakened people go after they die? When the effects of karma has ended. And this is where, if you understand all that I've said up to now, this will help you. Now, Nibbana is not a place. Nibbana is a state of mind. For those of you who would have studied the Heart Sutra, which is a very, very profound sutra on human psychology, it, there is one line in the Heart Sutra which says, when you move away from delusion, overturn your delusions, you are instantly in Nibbana. I reply, I mean, I repeat, Nibbana is not a place somewhere. Nibbana is a state of mind that is instant. The instant Sister Li Ming has Yuan Li move away, Dian Tao, her delusions. She becomes awakened. Instantly, she has Jiu Jing Nie Pan. That is why we say when the Buddha became enlightened, awakened at the age of 35, his mind immediately has entered Nibbana. When he died at the age of 80, that's why we call it Pari Nibbana. Another time entering Nibbana, this time with the body no more. So Nibbana is not a place where there is no more karma. Remember when you have awakened being, when he dies, the effects of karma has ended. So there is now no more becoming. Before that, at every moment, for us right now, we are having some form of becoming. So Sister Li Ming has sat and listened to me. And if she understands, she has become a slightly different person. So the Buddha has described Nibbana, that mental state, as the ultimate happiness and freedom. But beyond that, the Buddha doesn't define it. Remember, we are created by our karma. Awakened people after death, when there is no more karma at all, they are not created or become. They are not created or become. They are no longer recycled into another form. So they can't even be defined, even as existing or not. And some of you who have been reading might realize that when someone asked the Buddha, when the enlightened being died, does he exist, does he not exist, does he exist and not exist, all of which cannot be answered because that state cannot be defined. But for you and me to know what that means and to experience the Bana as the ultimate happiness and freedom, that the Buddha described, you will have to find out for yourselves. Remember, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, the Eightfold Path is what we follow. But the Eightfold Path does not end at the Eighth Factor. Please know that there is a Ninth Factor, Kosama Yana. 
right knowledge or wisdom or insight. And that leads to Sama Vimuti, right? Liberation, the tenth factor of the path. Sama Yana and Sama Vimuti is not something you can practice. Sama Yana and Sama Vimuti is the result of the first eight factors. But the ultimate aim of these eight factors is insight, which will lead to liberation. Remember, the ultimate goal of Buddhism Nibbana is liberation, freedom. So there are three types of wisdom. You have intellectual wisdom, like what we discuss, talk, share. So we may understand in theory. Now you've got to go and reflect on it, meditate on it, contemplate on it. And finally, you see the reality yourself. So we are discussing here, discussing further, contemplating further here. Direct insight here, insight wisdom. This is my last slide. And as usual, I would like to end with a story. So a Zen master was asked, Master, what happens after we die? And the famous master said, I don't know. And the questioner was surprised. What do you mean? Aren't you a Zen master? How can you say you don't know? And he replied, yes, I am a Zen master, but I'm not a dead one. What does this teach us? The Buddha was a very practical person. He doesn't believe in metaphysical conjecture. It's a very, very pragmatic thing. Like what is taught here? What happens after we die? Anything that I tell you will be conjecture. It is metaphysics. Meta means beyond physics, the physical realm. So, yes, I'm a Zen master, he said. But I'm not a dead one. I'm alive in this moment. So similarly for me as a doctor, if Sister Li Ming is to ask me, Dr. Wong, can I ask you something? What happens after we die? My answer will be, we will give your bed to another patient. And that is the most realistic answer, one that you can prove, one that does not require conjecture, one that you can verify experience for yourself to be the truth. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Right, thank you so much, yeah, Dr. Wong. Right, um, what a wonderful and enlightening um, Dharma sharing session tonight. Now we have a better perspective on what karma actually entails, right? And also uh, what I've always been perceived as fate. Because um, we often uh, commonly hear what people say that, you know, when things happen, uh, they will always say, oh, blame it on the karma. Yeah, it's the karma. So I believe after tonight's session, we now have a clearer and better understanding on this. Right, so now we'll move on to the Q&A session now where we will take in questions from our viewers uh, to be answered by Dr. Punya. So um, it, it, we appreciate that if uh, our viewers can actually post it on the comment box and we will pick the questions up from there. Right? Okay, so I think um, we have a question now. The first question is by our viewer, um, Bliss Rizal, right? Um, he actually posted a question to ask on um, uh, had, Buddha has actually taught us on uh, 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 ways on how to actually uh, lessen our uh, any any evil um, deeds or, or bad karma. So um, he's from Philippines, so uh, he's more exposed to uh, more Mahayana teachings. Uh, so his question is that whether um, chanting. Um, Kuan Yin uh, or uh, Bodhisattvas, uh, basically chanting, will that actually lessen um, the karma or, uh, you know, to purify any evil? Yeah, please explain on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brother Rizal. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, the seeds that we planted will not disappear. If you had planted good seeds, that good seeds will be with you until you become enlightened, fully enlightened. Similarly, for the bad seeds, 
what we can do is that we all want our good seeds to manifest. We all want our good seeds to come to some form of happy fruition. To do that, that shadow of yours must always remain in a bright light. So we do good deeds. Now, because we are unenlightened beings, we also similarly are planting weeds. But we do not want those weeds to come to fruition, much less we do not know what are the weeds that we had planted in the past, distant past, for example. So as not to allow the conditions or to minimize the conditions for the past bad weeds to come to fruition, we create conditions which are good now. What are these wholesome conditions? Wholesome conditions arise from non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion. Now, a lot of people think, oh, I can sacrifice a, a, a rose pig and offer to something, and maybe that will take away my bad karma. Well, that's sadly not true. Now, I do not know whether how many of you are aware of the expression, a scapegoat. Scapegoat is literally a belief by some religion that they take a goat and then they release it into the forest, into the, the desert, and then that goat carries their bad sins along and die. Or you get something to be sacrificed for you. In the Buddha's time, the Buddha was very against people sacrificing animals because he said it does not work. He was also against people doing ritualistic bathing. It's in the canon where he had a discussion with people who were going to bathe in the river to wash away their sins, and the Buddha disagreed. Now, you mentioned about practices like chanting, reciting bodhisattvas and Buddha's names. Now, first and foremost, if you are doing it for good, wholesome reasons, then you are creating states of mind which are similarly wholesome. When you, for example, chant the Bodhisattva or the Buddha's name, you are actually calming your mind down. Beat by beat, beat by beat, you actually create a state of samadhi, stillness, which is wholesome. And if you go on and do other wholesome acts, a lot of opportunities for you to do wholesome acts in, in, in the Philippines, uh, lots of opportunities, so these wholesome acts is like the water that will dilute that unwholesome salt. So that salt does not come to fruition. It does not mean that the bad seeds has disappeared. But what it means is that you have created a lot of wholesome conditions whereby that bad seed or weed does not come, but that your garden will instead have all these beautiful flowers blooming. Remember, you have good seeds as well. So when you create good conditions, your good seeds come to fruition. Now, whether you say it's only chanting the certain Buddha's name or only chanting a certain Bodhisattva's name, or well, that's not true. It's any wholesome action. All right? I, I think that as long as your actions are based on non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. They are actions which are based on metta, karuna, mudita, upekka, that means loving kindness, compassion, etc. Then those good deeds will be like creating the light that will give you that shadow that never leaves. All right? I hope I've answered your question. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Awal. Um, right. Let's take one last question from our viewer. Uh, that's from Pradeep. Right, his question is on what effect does bad karma have on your body? Uh, I, I believe his question is uh, more on related to health per se. Yeah. So please explain. Randeep, are you from India? The name is not a common name in our country. I assume you must be from somewhere else. Not a common surname or name, I'm afraid. Uh, anyway, good to interact with you, Brother Pradeep. What effects does bad karma have on your body? Well, first and foremost, unwholesome karma is going to give rise to dukkha. Dukkha, 
as I used in earlier example using Sister Liming, has the same meaning as in Dukkha Chitta. Dukkha is not just pain, Dukkha is emotional stress. Our emo that my younger students use all the time, oh, today I feel emo. Lah. Okay, I have to Google to see what that means, you know. It's a sensation of this ease. What the late, what one late venerable say, mm, song, oh, song, you know, you feel something is not right. So that stress, that this ease, that emotional unhappiness or un emotional state that is negative is of course going to have an effect on our body. Our bodies have got, have adapted a lot of stress hormones. Once you have a state of continuous stress, these stress hormones help you to either fight or flight. That means either fight or run. And these hormones in the long run will have deleterious effects on our physical body. I mean, literally, you can see people who are under a lot of stress age very rapidly. Okay, just look at people who are under a lot of stress within literally a year or two, you see their physical bodies age. So, of course, bad karma will have effects on our physical body. Now, some people ask me questions like, oh, I've got cancer. Is it my bad karma? As I said, that question cannot be answered in a very simplistic way. It is so easy to say, yeah, 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 it's your bad karma. But there's no canonical basis for it. The Buddha had actually quite clearly stated out that you cannot just blame it on karma. It is part of nature. It is part of anicca. It is part of the dukkha, the instability and unreliability of our physical bodies. So people say, why me? You know, why I get cancer? But the question is, why not you? I mean, look, if you are a smoker, you have abused your lungs for 20 years, why not you? Why, why are you so special that you should be spared? Or similarly, if you had been a person who had been drinking alcohol like crazy and then you develop failure of the liver and you say, why me, why me, why not you? You have created so many natural causes for this to arise. So I think that if you're asking me whether bad karma will give me cancer, then the answer is not so simplistic. As I said right at the beginning, it is not this equals that. It is not that simple. It's a very, very complex thing. And in fact, the Buddha said none of us can figure out the complexities of karma because we have planted so many causes in the past. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Wow. So that's one marvelous and inspiring sharing and Q&A session that we have tonight. I'm sure this has given us all uh, much more insight into um, karma and faith. So we are the heir of our own karma. A very timely reminder that we all have to continuously practice the Noble Eightfold Path and to do wholesome dips all the time. So thank you for all the questions posted and to Dr. Punya Wong once again. And let us rejoice together. Sadhu, sadhus.